Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome to our second installment of WGA Live, where Managing Editor George Von Drisco will be answering your woodworking questions live on air. Hi, George. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Really good. Hanging in there? Yes. Yeah. So I'll so be gathering your questions, um, and, but we'll also be taking some live questions tonight. So if any of you watching have something to ask George, just comment in the section below here. Um, you can type in your questions right there and there are some live ones. Um, also below the window, you'll see a link to sign up for the WWGA newsletter. So make sure to do that if you haven't done that already. George, are you ready to get started? Well, let me let me say a couple things before uh, we start doing the questions. One is coming off of the last one, a couple of people asked, you know, we, we showed some stuff, but we didn't necessarily we didn't do any cuts, we didn't actually fire up any tools. Um, we did that on purpose because you know we do a lot of video, and one of the benefits of the video is we can take actions that take a long time and compress them into a shorter time frame. Um, and of course, when we do this live, can't compress. Um, so that was actually an intentional move on our part. But we are going to try to do more real machining uh, as we go through these Q and A's, so that you get to see some sawdust really being made. Um, and then the other thing I like to say is, remember, this is live, so anything could. <laughs> so uh, it's not like watching one of the videos where we have the opportunity to do a retake. Um, so cut us a little slack if it takes us a while to find the tool that pertains to your question. Chris is running the camera over there, and my daughter Ginny is not here today. She helped out last time to bring in tools and material and stuff. Um, so this time Chris is going to double duty, and we'll do this as best as we can. Hit it, Bailey. What do you got? <laughs> All right. Our first question is from Barry B. He says, I was recently given a Delta TP305 planer. When I ran a piece of cherry through the planer, I noticed that there was a small ridge approximately two inches from both ends, ends of the wood. Is this normal? He says, I'm assuming that it is the lead in distance from the start of the feed belt to the cutting head. What, if anything, can I do about that? All right, well, let me, we're actually going to head to the planer. Let me get some hearing protection. Now, one of the things I got to say is, we field questions ahead of time, um, so there's some stuff that we've already prepped for, and that's going to help us get through more questions more quickly as we get your questions coming in. So this question, what it's really about is a uh, snipe hunt. Uh, what, what's being described here is what happens with, especially with benchtop planers, um, there can be a problem with the cut. Let me sh show you the problem and then show you working on the problem. Put on hearing protection if you need it. All right, this is subtle because the snipe isn't too bad out of this planer as it is. But right here on the end of the board, this is what we're talking about. There's an overcut, and then there's a little bit of a ridge right here, and I can really feel it. And then it's nice and flat, nice and flat, nice and flat. And then on this board, it didn't snipe on this end. It only sniped on the infeed side. All right, now, Krista, if you can come around and kind of show the business end of the planer here. Right about here, you there? Okay, so here's the deal, especially with benchtop planers. The dynamic here is that sometimes when the material goes in and it hits that first infeed roller on a real small scale, the cutter head rocks up. That causes that snipe that we're seeing, that overcut on the lead end of the cut, when the material goes through and engages the outfeed roller, now it's in contact with both rollers, the cutter head levels out, then it comes out from under the infeed roller, that causes the cutter head to cock down, which can then cause a snipe on the outfeed end. So 
it's fairly prevalent really with these bench top planers. One of the ways around it is this. So what you'll see on some bench top planers is the addition of a lock like this. So we're going to do another cut. I'm going to take another 64th or so of an inch off. This time I'm going to activate the lock, which I did not do on the first cut. Second verse, same as the first. And by having that lock engage, just go ahead and spin back. There we go. By having that lock engage, it took that wiggle out of the head, and that goes a long way toward reducing the sight. Now, a couple things. On stationary planers, you overcome this problem by controlling the down pressure on the in-feed and out-feed rollers. Check your owner's manual for how to do that. On benchtop planers, like I said, it's typically overcome with a lock. If your planer doesn't have a lock, then here's another thing we can do. Simplest thing, cut the material longer by the amount of snipe on each end. If you're getting two inches of snipe per end, cut the board four inches too long before you plane it, cut the snipe off before you use the board. If you lead and chase the board you want with another board, then you'll eliminate the snipe. What will happen is you'll get the snipe in the scrap, not in your target piece. So lead the cut, meaning put in a board, put this one right up against the end grain of that one, then they go, put another board right up against the end grain here, then they go, and that's going to put the snipe in the scrap instead of the snipe in your good piece. All right? All right. Next question is from Mike. He says, hi, George. I want to know what one of around the back of the neck earplugs you use. I bought one set, but they are so tight they nearly meet each other in the middle of my head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sometimes, um, you know, these, these things need to be comfortable, otherwise you're not going to wear them. Um, this particular brand is SenseGuard, S-E-N-S-G-A-R-D. Um, SenseGuard.com is the manufacturer. Uh, we also do sell these in the WWGOA shop. So if you go to WWGOA.com and then go to, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's called shop or store, uh, but it's where we sell stuff. And we also sell these earmuffs there, this hearing protection there. Cool. So if you're well, just you're joining us now, you are watching Deck Live. We're talking editor George Von He's answering all your questions. So if you have one, uh, you can type it down in the comment box below, and we'll try to answer it on air. Next question for you, George, is from Jan T. She says, I could use some advice on using a bird's mouth router bit. I find it really tricky setting it up in order to get a perfect fit. Getting the height of the bit and the exact location of the fence is a real puzzle. And of course, it changes for different thicknesses of wood. Is there a formula for figuring it out, or is it just trial and error? OK, this is pretty cool. Uh, bird's mouth router bits are kind of obscure. I think Chris does stay there for a second. And then, Krista, if you could come in, bring the camera in on the end grain of this thing. I've got a column assembly here that I made at some point in my woodworking career. And this was put together with a bird's mouth bit. Now, if you look closely at this, how do we look? Mm, yeah, oh, no. yeah. All right. So here's what we got. When you look at these joints, we've got, i got to look at it a second. It goes, the cut is like this, and then like this, the end of this board being square. And then when we come around the column, the cut looks like this, and like this, if I could draw straight. This is the bird's mouth cut. So what's pretty cool about this is that you make this cut in the edge of this board. You don't do anything to this one. Then you glue them together to make a hollow column like this. My understanding is that the advent of this was to make ship's mass. 
and they could be hollow on the inside, but they have a lot of structural rigidity because of the way the joint came together. Now, if you look at this, you can probably tell there are going to be a lot of variables. If I know I want to make an 8-inch diameter column, the width of this board will affect that. The thickness of the boards will affect that. How I make the cut will affect that. So the good news is I've used these cutters. The bad news is, no, I'm sorry, I don't have a formula for this. I didn't use it enough to really develop a rock-solid technique to give me a formulaic approach. Um, I used it just enough to kind of understand the concept. Um, so what I would do if I was going to use one of these regularly is I would start by cutting boards to a fixed width, cut the bird's mouth, put it together, and see what I get, and record that information and keep a test piece. Then do it again with a different thickness and a different width, and just work with those variables. And I think if you did this, I bet, five or six times, you could get this a consistency to this that would allow you to generate some predictability. Um, so it's a very interesting question. Not many people would know about that bird's mouth bit. Um, so it's pretty interesting that you're asking about that. It is very cool, and it does make a really, really strong hollow column. Um, but sorry, I don't know more about a formula for it. <laughs> Can't answer them all, right? Yeah. All right, next question for you, George, is from Todd C. He says, a friend asked me to build her a 15-inch round top table using a small boat paddles for the legs. It's a three-legged table with the paddles around the perimeter, and I'm struggling to find an easy way to determine where to place the legs. What's the easiest way to lay out the 120-degree length? Okay, so we've got we've got a round thing. Doesn't really matter if it's round or not, but we want to equally position three somethings, three legs within a thing. We're going to do some geometry. Um, Chris, I'm going to get some stuff. And then I'm going to ask you to come toward the workbench and get to where you can look down at the workbench. I'm going to get a piece of scrap I can do some drawing on. And are we are you on the board now? Yep. Okay. These are trammel points. This has got a point on it. This has got a pencil on it. We're just headed for a really big compass here. When I connect them to this, it becomes a beam compass. And it's going to let us draw a big circle. He says with confidence. Remember what I said about this being live? Let me get a different board here. The best laid plans of mice and men. All right, so here's what you have to do. What we're after again is three things equally spaced upon a circle. So I'm going to just arbitrarily set my compass here based on the size of my piece. We positioned okay? All right. So what you would do is say, I've got a 15-inch project. It sounds like that's what this is. And so I want my legs to be on a 13-inch circle within the 15-inch top. So you're going to draw that 13-inch circle. Whoops, my center slipped. We're back to that live TV thing again. Let me flip, and we're going to go again. This is MDF I'm drawing on, and boy, is the surface hard, which made it a little difficult for me to get the center of my compass in there. All right, we've got a circle. Don't change the radius of the circle. Now what you do is put the point of your compass on the circle, draw a line, point of the compass on that line where it intersects the circle, draw a line, Second verse, same as the first. We're going to keep working our way all the way around. What this operation really does 
is it equally divides the circumference of the circle, because now we end up back here again, it equally divides the circumference of the circle into six equal parts. So the answer to the question is, I want three evenly spaced legs. Well, then you only use every other one. And that will give you three evenly spaced legs. All right. Very cool. Next question for you is from Brett S. He says, in the absence of a jointer, what technique can be used with a different power tool to accomplish a similar jointer test? OK, good question. I'm going to get a computer for this one. So to answer this, so the question is, I don't own a joiner, but I want to make a straight edge. What can I do about this? There are a lot of approaches to this. You can joint on a router table. You can joint with a handheld router. You can joint on the table saw. There's a pretty cool jig for that. A lot of approaches. And the really good news is if you go to www.goa.com, and then we have this search bar up here on the website. And to answer this particular question, um, what I would do is go to the search bar and look up, how do you spell jointing? N-T-I-N-G, go. And using that search window, you're going to end up with a list of the articles and the videos we have related to this. And I know that Dave McKendrick has covered jointing on the router table. Let me scroll down a little bit and see what we get for some results here. Probably very difficult for you to see as we transmit this through the worldwide interweb. But there's a bunch of results here. Um, like I said, McKintrick has covered jointing on the router table. I did a story on jointing on the table saw. Uh, Seth Keller, I think, did jointing with the handheld router. And it's either in the form of a free video or article, or in some cases, a premium video covered there on the website. So that's my easiest advice to get all of this covered, is have a look at that stuff on WWG Way. Great. Next question for you, George, is from Justin K. He says, as a beginning wood crafter and being retired, I have a limited, and I mean limited, funds with which to purchase anything. He says that I want to get into planing, so what would be the proper planer to buy? Um, I'm going to answer this question the same way. Uh, Paul Mayer did a good story about a starter set of hand planes, and in all honesty, I'm not much of a hand plane guy. Um, I always say most of my hand tools are in a glass covered cabinet and there's a sign on it that says break glass in case of emergency. I just don't do a lot of hand tool work. So Paul's much more of a hand tool guy and in that article he covers a variety of different planes, buying advice, and also helps focus if you're doing this then try this. So same story, www.goa.com, go to that search bar in the upper right hand window, upper right hand corner and put hand planes in there and see what we've got. I know the article is there. Great. So just to recap, if you're joining us now, uh, we're going live. Marika is answering the question. If you have any questions um, that you want to ask George right now, you can just comment on the little box below, and we'll try to get to some of those tonight. All right, George, next question for you is from Greg N. He says, I have a small 6-inch benchtop model from Porter Cable. The jointer has a speed control knob, and the instructions suggest lowering the speed when jointing narrower stocks or when jointing softwoods. I'm wondering what advantage, if any, would be gained by lowering the speed of the cutter head. I sometimes remember to lower the speed control and sometimes not, but I don't notice any difference in the result. OK, so Krista, let's point to the jointer. Um, so we're talking about not a stationary joint like I've got here, but I've seen this on benchtop joiners. I used to have a delta benchtop joiner that also had a variable speed on it. So one line in the sand here just in the world of jointers is um, most of the stationary joiners have induction motors connected by a belt to the cutter head, and the benchtop jointers often have universal motors like you would find in a router. Um, either belt connected or even direct drive to the cutter head. 
Um, it puzzled me too when I had that delta bench top joiner as to why I would ever want to slow that down. Uh, most stationary joiners run all the time at about 6,000 RPM or so. Um, if I were you, I guess I would just leave it on the high RPM and not worry about it. I it generally more cuts per minute, cuts per minute being how many revolutions the cutter head is doing, multiplied times the number of knives in the cutter head. So if this is a three knife cutter head at 6,000 ripums. It's given us 18,000 cuts per minute. Generally more cuts per minute is better. So I just can't think of a good reason why you should slow the jointer down in order to make any cuts at all. So uh, don't sweat the small stuff, variable speed being the small stuff. I wouldn't slow it down. All right, next question is from Bob. He says, how do I go on getting the proportions of the display cabinet pleasing to the eye as I have to design the design and make one my own? Any suggestions would be much appreciated. Okay, so this time, Krista, I think you can stay about where you are and face this way. This is a visual answer. This is a great question because I am really, really bad at designing stuff. And the question being about as I design a project, I want it to look okay when I'm done. So what's a cheat that I can use to make sure it's going to look okay? And here's what I do whenever I can. I use what's called, so is this going to be okay or is it too glary for you? Glary. And angle That's back. Perfect. Okay. So I use, whenever I can, I use what's called the golden proportion. And so tell me, just yell, Krista, if I angle it's too much. Perfect. The golden proportion is a ratio of 1.6 to 1. That's the information. What do we do with it that? Um, I've got a cabinet that I've used in cabinet making classes all the time. If any of you saw me at the uh, woodworking shows in the last season, I built the cabinet there that I use this for. The way I use it is to say, I know that I want the cabinet to be some width. In that case, in the case of those cabinets, it was 18 inches wide. How tall, how long should it be so that relative to the 18, it's going to look okay. So I want this number. The way I figure that out is I multiply 18 times 1.6. That gave me a number, which I think was like 27 and change. It's something like 27 and 7 eighths for my overall height. And when you do that, you build that box, this result is what's called the golden rectangle. And this is pretty cool. This has been around more than centuries. This has been around for millennia. And the Greeks and the Romans were designing buildings with this a long time ago. And somebody made the connection that when we build stuff in these proportions, it looks good. Now, you can use this on a big scale. You can use it on a small scale. Um, not that long ago, I think last winter or so, um, you may have seen I built some cremation boxes. And those boxes ended up being five inches high, eight inches long, and then five inches deep. Five times 1.6 is eight. So a golden rectangle on the front of the box square on the end of the box gives you, again, that aesthetic of it being visually pleasing. So golden proportion, 1.6 to 1, leads to a golden rectangle. Whenever you can use that, it's a great cheat because centuries have shown us that humans like how that golden rectangle looks. Very cool. Very cool. So just a quick update uh, for the viewers out there. We're having a small technological glitch with the comment section down below. Um, we can see the questions on our end, but you won't be able to see it on your end. So if you have a question, just you know continue to post it down there. We'll still be able to see it. Um, it sounds like we may have it fixed right now. But anyway, George, I have a live question for you. Are you ready for that? Uh, Gregory Hale asks, what's the best way to resize a Forster bit? 
What's the best way to resize, like make it a different size? What's the best way to resize a Forster bit to a custom size? Resize a Forster bit to a custom size. All right. Um, well, you can just kind of follow me. I'm going to get a Forster bit, and then we'll come back over here. My Forster bits are over here. All right, oh, coming back, coming back, coming back. Let's we'll go right here. Let's go. All right, so first thing, let's define a Forstner bit. This is a set of Forstner bits. Are you there, Chris? Are you pan down a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, lots of benefits to Forstner bits. A big one being that they drill a very flat bottom hole. Another one being that, unlike a lot of other drill bits, with Forstner bits, you can drill holes that are overlapping. So I guess the question is, you know, in this case, this is a, I got to look, this is a one and a quarter inch diameter. Um, if I wanted it to be a little bit smaller, how would I do that? Um, a little, there's a little bit of an I don't know here because I've never done that before. Um, but what I think you could do, if you own a wood lathe, you could chuck this in the wood lathe. We want to spin it. And while it's spinning, I think you could use a metalworking file and reduce the outside diameter until you get that where you want it to be. Um, the sharpening on this is done on this bevel on the inside. Is that are we there at all? The sharpening on a Forstner bit is done on this bevel on the inside. So the out so working on the outside here shouldn't affect that. The outside does have a little bit of a taper to it. Uh, this being a larger diameter than this. So if you do diminish that diameter of the file, you'd want to make sure that you maintain that angle throughout. Um, so I think spin it, use a file in order to remove material, and then use a vernier, um, I'm sorry, a digital caliper, or whatever your measuring device is, to check it, see if it's where you want, take a little more off. And it shouldn't affect um, its ability to cut, and it should allow you to go ahead and make that whatever diameter you want. And if that works, let us know, because that's kind of a cool thing to try. All right. Next question for you is from Jim M. He says that a friend recently gave me a 1983 KTS jointer made in Taiwan. In attempting to use a dial indicator to set the knives in this jointer, something I've never done before, I find that it appears the drum is not parallel to the outfeed tables at both ends. From the little I know, this seems to be making it difficult to find top dead center and set the knives. And he wonders, what am I doing wrong? And by the way, he says he thinks you're the god of woodwork, George. Uh, well, thank you. Extra points for that last comment. Um, <laughs> all right, so we'll use this jointer as an example, but I'm going to get some stuff first. All right, I'm done. Okay, so a couple things. First, if you can get kind of here. First, let's talk through the dial indicator part of this that he's asking about, just in case anybody's not familiar with that. This is a dial indicator setup. Historically, really, it's more of a machine shop thing, a metalworking thing, than a woodworking thing. But they have really found their way into shops, and they're wonderful to use when you're setting up tools. So the way it works, are you? Can you see that dial pretty well? Okay. Turn that a little. This dial has a plunger connected to it. When the plunger goes up and down, the needle moves. Total travel around the face of the dial is the equivalent of an inch. So when we move just a little bit, we're measuring in thousandths of an inch. The way I would use this on a jointer would be, with the jointer unplugged, we could open up the guard, and I'm going to come this way a little bit, Kristen, I want to get that clamp. Open up the guard, and then we could come in with the dial indicator, and it sounds like the problem that he's already diagnosed is did a reading on the outfeed table, then moving this to the cutter head, 
the way you would determine if that's parallel or not is find top dead center, take a reading, move this to another spot, top dead center, take a reading. And what he determined by that is that the cutter head itself is not perfectly parallel to the bed of the jointer. Now I think you can still be okay with this. I think you can still be okay. Because what we can do is set the knives relative to the bed of the jointer. One way to do that is with the dial indicator. If you don't have a dial indicator, here's another way that you can do this. And this is something else too. We've got some tips and techniques on the website for this. What I'm looking for with this straight edge is I'm rolling the cutter head. Again, the jointer's unplugged. I'm rolling that cutter head under the steel rule. And I can feel this drag, and I'll shut up for a second, and we'll see if by any chance you can hear this. It's just kissing the bottom of this ruler. Then I come over to the other side. And it's kissing the bottom of the ruler. By using the jack screws, then what I can do is raise and lower the cutter head until on this side of the bed. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Using the jack screws, I can raise and lower the knife until I have the same kiss here that I have here. And what, what's cool about this is the whole top dead center thing. Top dead center is the point where that knife is at the maximum part of its arc, the height, the top of its arc. So by dragging it across the bottom of the ruler like that, it's automatically finding top dead center. We set it for the same drag and the same drag for every knife. That's going to result in knives that are perfectly parallel to the outfeed table regardless of the position of the head. So one of the things some jointers have is a, uh, what some jointers have is a device that kind of it bridges the knife on the cutter head and there's two pods on there that rest on the cutter and then there's a high spot in the middle of that bridge and you bring the knife up until it kisses the bottom of that high spot. You wouldn't want to use that style here because then you're setting the knife to the cutter head. On your jointer, because they're out of parallel, you want to be sure you're setting the knife to the bed, which either the steel rule or dial indicator will help make happen for you. Great, that sounds good. Thanks, George. Uh, just a quick update, we are live with WBUA Managing Editor George Vandrisco. We're answering your questions tonight. We have a couple technical glitches going on right now. Sorry about that, just kind of the nature of the live beast. Um, also, quick plug, the WWGA newsletter sign up is right below the window that you're watching, so make sure to sign up uh, to stay up to date with George and all the happenings on GOA if you haven't done that yet. Uh, George, are you ready for another live question? Sure. What's the worst? All right. Uh, Rich said, or is wondering, what is the best way to repair damaged veneer? Damaged veneer? Veneer. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm assuming, so Rich, if you're still watching, maybe flesh this out on info if I answer this incorrectly. I'm going to assume the veneer is already on something and something bad happened. For instance, um, sometimes you'll see a bubble in a piece of veneer. Um, if that's the case, what, can, what people will do is split the bubble with a razor knife and then a lot of times if you gently apply heat, like with a household iron, you can um, get that blister or that bubble to make new contact with the glue. The heating it up gets the glue to kind of reactivate. And once it's made contact again, roll it with a J roller or something like that. Um, if it's damaged in a water damage kind of a way, um, somebody set a gin and tonic on the table and the veneer's got a real bad mark in it now. Um, then the problem with veneer can be it's so thin there's not a lot of sanding room there so then it's possible that it's just going to have to come off altogether and get replaced. Um, I'm trying to think on the fly of other types of damage to veneer but if you're, you know Rich, if you've got a follow-up to that to help me focus that in better if I'm not answering your question let me know. Great. 
Next question for you is from Mark B, who's actually a woodworking teacher at Somerset High School in Somerset, Wisconsin. He says, hi George, my question is dealing with dovetails and half inch Baltic birch plywood. I use this material as it is readily available and we just need to cut it to size and not do any gluing to get it wide enough for our drawers. The issue I have is that it chips all the time. It's on the inside of the drawer when it's assembled, but I'd still like to know a secret to pre prevent this from happening. He says that I've even tried brand new bits and still got the chips and he's even cheated on his cuts and went backwards at the end of the cut. Any ideas? Yes, I've been up to Mark's school, and it's a very cool place. Um, now, Bailey, is it correct that people are saying the image is backwards on their screen? Yeah, sounds like we're having some. Is it is it because they're watching in the southern hemisphere? Maybe. No. So give me uh, give me one second here, and uh, let's see if we can help here. Now did it flip? I think so. Okay, so here's what, uh, let me get that. We're going to go to the dovetail jig next, Krista. And here's the reason for that. The last time we did the live shoot, Krista was running the camera. So in the current setting, everything on her monitor is backwards. So when I would say we're going to go this way, to her, it would look like I'm pointing this way, so then it was very confusing for her. So that's okay. We've returned it to being confusing for Krista, but now it's, does that, did that make it right for everybody else, Bailey? I think so. Okay. If anyone's having any issues, just comment down below. All right. Or is it, maybe it's upside down now. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good question. So if, if the, uh, if that made the writing backwards on the golden proportion, we'll go back. We'll revisit that after this. All right, so let's hit Mark's question. First off, Baltic birch. So um, if you can get on that edge there, Krista. Baltic birch is really in a, it's a category of plywood. It's called multi-ply plywood. And if you look at the plies, this is a piece of half-inch material. It's got, I believe, nine plies to it. That's a lot of plies. Makes it very stable. Baltic birch never has voids in it. It's a great choice for making drawers. Here's the problem, and it sounds like this is the problem Mark is having up there in scenic Somerset, Wisconsin, is the dovetails come out looking like that. That ain't so good. Um, the problem with Baltic birch can be, what do you need? Can you hold that up? Yeah. The problem with Baltic birch can be it's so darn chippy. Um, I've got a solution for this we can hit here on the dovetail jig. So this is one I cut earlier. I did not do what I'm about to show you, and this is what happened. First thing is your dovetail bit has to be really, really, really sharp. Uh, if the bit's getting dull, no matter what we do preemptively here, we're not going to get good results. And I'm going to have to just come past you unless you can reach that drop cord. Wonderful. Thank you. No big magic here. I'm going to put my drawer front and my drawer side in the dovetail jig. Get them properly positioned. The key to this is a scoring cut. So when we do a conventional, when we do a dovetail jig operation, the template guide bushing, router still unplugged, the guide bushing here is going to follow that template in, out, in, out. And so what I did on that first one is I entered in, came out, entered in, came out, and that's what caused all that blowout on this face to a point where you just wouldn't want to use that board. On this one, what I want you to watch for, and I think, Krista, if you can drop the camera in a second, what I want you to watch for is a scoring cut that I'm going to do 
I'm going to allow just the tip of the cutter to contact the material here on the face, and I'm actually going to climb cut. Normally on the dovetail jig, we want to cut from left to right, following our woodworking rule of working against the direction of rotation of the cutter. In this case, we're going to go from right to left to do a very gentle climb cut. Then I'll, I'll do that, and then I'll stop. Then we'll come back and actually do the dovetail. I want to make sure you see that um, scoring cut. All right, Krista, do we have ignition? I don't know what you're looking for. Did I just completely block the action for mm -hmm. you? All right. Yep. Well, that's unfortunate, but we're going to rock on. Very gentle contact. Now, as long as we're here, let me give you a safety. Let me harp on safety here. Notice that the router was on the dovetail jig. Then I turned it on. I shut it off, let it come to a complete stop, leaving it on the dovetail jig. Then I'm ready to remove it. If the router is turned on and I set it on the jig, there's too great a chance that we could set that carbide cutter into the aluminum comb, into the plywood, whatever. And that's not going to go well. So make sure you come to a start on the jig, you come to a stop on the jig. There's my scoring cut. It created that shoulder right there. What that does is it creates a stopping point for any chips that we might get. Now I'll come back and do my conventional left to right cut, allowing the guide bushing to follow the fingers, and we'll see the results difference between what I have now and what I did earlier today. Here we go. Great, great. George, you ready for another live question? No, we're not. All right. All right. Here, we, here we go means I'm going to turn the router back on. Oh, oh sorry. That's it. Okay. All right, let me grab what I had before. So Krista, that's, are you there? That's what we just did, and that's what I did earlier. Significant difference. So um, anytime I'm doing dovetails, I always do that scoring cut. Um, on Baltic birch in particular, I will do it as a climb cut in order to optimize the cut quality. All right. Uh, Bailey, Krista thinks we need to just write those numbers for the golden proportion on the board again. Oh, they sure. Because right, they were backwards. <laughs> we'll just hit that real fast, then we'll go back to your live question. All right. So golden proportion, to give you this again with it flipped the right way, 1.6. Is the golden proportion resulting in a golden rectangle? And I guess backwards it would be, I don't know what it would be. But now it's right. All right. All right, Bailey, what do you got? All right, we have a live question from Wayne M. He says, do you feel retrofitting a jointer with helix cutters is a good idea? I watched a video showing the process of changing out the cutter head, and it seems pretty complex. Okay, so so the question is helical cutter heads, Bailey. Is that the or helix cutter heads? Helix cutter heads. Right. Um, so let's just look at um, let's look at the jointer cutter head, Chris. And if you could just pan down a little bit so you mm -hmm. can see on this particular cutter head, what we've got to put this in context is straight knives in the jointer. So that knife is perfectly straight. Now the big dealio with helical cutter heads is that 
it puts the knife at a skew cut at an angle to whatever it is that you're jointing. And just like, you know, if, when you first learn to use a hand plane and at some point, uh, an instructor may have told you, don't plane dead parallel to the board, skew the plane just a little bit, and you'll get better cut quality. Same thing is happening if we put in a helical cutter head in a jointer or a planer. So the question, do I think it's worth the upgrade? I think it depends on what you're doing. Um, I've, obviously, I've got straight knives in my joiner. Um, I edge joint a lot of red oak is probably the wood I use the most. But the typical suspects, North American hardwoods, oak, walnut, maple, cherry, birch, every once in a while, especially with something that's a little squirrely, like a curly maple, a highly figured birch, um, I, at that point, wish I had spiral knives so I could get better cut quality off of my jointer. Um, however, for the most part, it's working okay with me. So I guess it depends if what you're finding is that because you work with a lot of highly figured woods, uh, you want to optimize that finish better than the economics, because the cutter heads are not inexpensive. Um, the economics of making that switch wouldn't be bad. Um, and then it depends, too, if we're talking about helical carbide tip cutter heads. Now, one of the benefits we get from that is that with carbide heads, the jointer, we can edge joint man-made materials. With tool steel knives in a joiner like this one has, you should not ever edge joint or joint man-made materials. Um, so that carbide will last you longer. Typically, the carbide inserts are four-sided. So when they get dull, edge and you're back in business. In this case, the whole knife has to come out, get resharpened, I have to reset the knives. So there's advantages and disadvantages, and I guess you just got to weigh the uh, economics for you versus against the payoff. All right. All right. Next question, question is from Tim H. He's got a two-part question, so I'll do them both for you, George. He says, my first question is when I'm using my Freud dado stack, uh, there are often small irregularities in the bottom of the dado cut that have to be cleaned up before gluing. Is there anything that can be done to prevent this? And then his second question is, how do you deal with shop clutter? He says, it seems simple enough, but the nagging question is always, why should I throw it away when it seems like something I may need and have to eventually rebuy? How do you deal with this to keep your shop organized or clutter free? Okay, so let's swing this way a little bit first. Uh, you're good there. Let me grab something with that. Here's a nail. And then, can you see what we have there? All right, so dado, uh, U shaped thingy, cross grain in our material. And the question is about the flat bottomness of a dado. Uh, this one, which was cut with a stack dado on a table saw, nice and flat across the bottom. And this is what I want because when I insert a piece of wood into that, in order for this to have good integrity, the material that goes into that dado, I want it to have good contact with the bottom of it because I'm going to have glue down there. And the more surface contact I have between the end of this and the face of this and the bed of glue, the better that joint is going to be. If, after making the cut with the dado head, this has got a bunch of scores in it, I think that adversely affects the integrity of the joint because it compromises the surface contact between those two pieces. Now, a couple things can make that happen. When we talk about a stackable dado, we've got two rim blades and then a bunch of chippers that go in between. It's a big blade sandwich. It's a big cookie. And if they're not all universal diameter, uniform diameter, then you're going to have some blades that cut more than others. What may have happened is if you ever had the set sharpened and you can say you only sent in the two rim blades, which slightly in diameter, and that's going to leave all the chippers proud. Anytime a dado stack goes in, even if only part of it seems dull, you got to send the whole stack so it's all ground uniformly. Um, so the first thing I would try is, um, even if it doesn't seem like it's dull, I would have it sharpened 
to try to bring everything down to a universal, a uniform diameter so that you get a flat bottom dado. As far as fixing it once it's cut, boy, that'd be tough. You know, if you've got a dado across a 12 or 24 inch wide piece of plywood for a cabinet and you try to level all that out, I think you'd just make it worse. So you really want to trough the blade to be nice and flat on the bottom for your glue bed. Um, now, shop clutter. Uh, people who are watching this and know me well are laughing at the notion that you're asking me about resolution. Three thousand pounds of stuff to a dump because I knew it wasn't worth moving here. So this was you know, every thing that I had saved for decades thinking someday I might use it. But let me give you some solutions. So uh, Chris, I'm going to ask you to do a big move here. We're going to go, let's go this way first because it's closer. I'll give this a shove. Thank you. All right, so one, let's look at this rack first. In a way that I can pretty easily flip through them and see what I have, which makes it more likely that I'm going to use these small offcuts. So, one of my solutions for just being able to keep small stuff, get to it, and use it is this rack. Then, Krista, just go ahead and point in the door. I guess I'll walk in here. This rack is another example of that. This gives me an opportunity to take small pieces and stand them up in here. And then I can kind of look down at it, see what I've got in here, what I need, what I can use. So pretty simple. It's about 36 inches wide. It's got an angle cut on the end so I can do tall stuff. That's as far as the door goes. Tall stuff in the back, short stuff in the front. That's another solution. Now let's walk that way. And probably the thing that helps me the most, and it's not so much with scrap, but it's more stuff that I'm using on a fairly regular basis, is this set of shelving. I put up these steel shelves. I went to somewhere, Walmart, and I got a bunch of Tupperware that's all the same size, but different capacities this way. So the rectangle is the same size on all of them but there's different depths. Put my stuff in there, and then I wrote on the end of it, hinges and pulls, miscellaneous hardware, <clears throat> safety devices, pneumatic parts, featherboards. So when this is neatly organized, I can stand here, I can look at the face of the bins, I can pull a bin down, get the stuff I need, put everything back. So that's really helped me a lot with extra stuff, um, extra little stuff that I, I need someday. All right, Great. Bailey, what do you got? Well, we're getting down to about the seven-minute mark, George, so I'm going to try to um, throw a couple last questions at you. Um, just And we're also reminding our to sign up for the WWGA newsletter. If you haven't done it yet, there, there should be a link right below your window here. Um, George, here's a live question for you from Hugh. He says, occasionally my DeWalt 13-inch planar depth control wheel will move during operation. Is there an adjustment to stop this movement? So the depth adjustment must be spinning just a little bit. Well, I don't know. I wonder. Um, it seems to me that there must be kind of an idler pulley on that connection where as you're turning that, I'm looking off at my planer while I'm answering the question, while you're turning the height of uh, the depth control um, and it's driving that whole mechanism, um, adding some tension to the drive mechanism by moving that idler pulley forward I think would reduce the likelihood that that could spin just from vibration of the machine. Um, I would have to default to the idea of maybe giving DeWalt the call, um, call their customer service and you know in all likelihood if it's happening to you it's probably happened before and they might have a good simple solution for that but that's off the top of my head, I'd look for that idler on the drive mechanism and see if you can tension that a little bit. Great. So our last question for you tonight um, is from Mike M. And he's got some nice words to say, so I'm going to share them with you, George. 
He says, to, the, to George and the team, I love all the great videos available on DVD and now as a premium member of WW2A. Please know that your detailed videos are so helpful. A lot of shows and articles illustrate how-tos, but they don't get the level of detail we need to get the job done or to build our skill and knowledge level. He says, I do have lots of questions. It would be great to actually visit you in your new shop and watch videotaping. Maybe have lunch with you and get a chance to talk with you on your techniques. Would that ever be possible? Well, that's that's a great one to save for last, Bailey. Wow, way to, way to end us on positive note. So let me let me uh, back up the truck a little bit. We started shooting videos in fall of 2007, and I end up being in front of the camera for a lot of this stuff. Um, but there's a huge team of people involved with this. Uh, Jim, Anya, Mike Bale, our producer, a long time ago. Sonia, Bailey, I'm going to leave so many people out, Miguel, Chris, Sam, uh, we've had a number of directors, Christian, Skyler, um, I know I'm forgetting some. So as a result, or a long time ago when we first started shooting video, we decided that we really wanted to make sure that we captured every required step in every video. And what can be difficult sometimes is we produce this stuff and then it goes out and we think we're doing okay, but it's great to hear this positive feedback to know that you appreciate uh, the attention to detail that's been put in by the entire team to make sure that that stuff is working. Um, the idea of, uh, this is the shop of course in which we shoot the video, um, the idea of could somebody come to the shop, watch the video get shot, have lunch with the crew, um, let's do this. For those of you watching, um, how many of you would be interested in doing that? Raise your hand. Well, that is a very good reaction. So that obviously, okay, I don't know what you did, I don't know. However, that seems like a pretty cool idea. Um, so I think we have to put that one in the hopper and uh, stew on that and figure out how we could work out the logistics so a person or two could be here to watch videos. I think that'd be kind of cool. And maybe interact on camera it would be kind of neat. So George, um, that, that's the last of the questions we have tonight. If anyone has any questions that you know we didn't get to tonight, how can they get in touch with you? Um, well, we have Ask the Editor is a regular feature on www.goa.com. So you can submit questions there, and then myself or one of the contributing editors will get to it. You know, a lot of times these questions become the video clips that we shoot, um, which end up online in our library of videos. Um, so um, email the questions in and we'll get to it as fast as we can. Sounds great. Well, any closing comments for tonight, George? Well, I, I kind of feel, you know, for people of my vintage, when we do this live stuff, I feel like the end here is like romper room and I need my little magic mirror of uh, I can see Michael, I can see Nancy, I can see Jim. I can see John, I can see Tim. Um, but other than that, Kirsten, do you want to say goodbye to the camera? Do you want to come around and that's your pretty ardently shaking your head no. Yeah, no, she doesn't want to say goodbye to the camera. So thanks for tuning in. These are a blast. And uh, from my perspective, an hour goes by in about four minutes. Um, this goes by really fast. Thanks to the really good questions that you folks submit. Great. Well, thanks, George. We'll see you next time. All right.